how to stop sinning. Sin is going to happen in an instant. It happens with just the look of an eye. Besetting sins are those tenacious habits in our lives that cling to us like glue and hold us in their destructive power. No matter how hard we try, we often cannot seem to break them. We cannot loosen their grip. Sometimes we feel so hopeless and helpless that we just give up. Besetting sins can include almost anything. Gluttony, lust, greed, anger, depression, despair, pride, various passions. But they all have one common denominator, the ability to overpower us and possess our soul. How can the Christian overcome them? I'm convinced that we will never have power in our lives over these sins, these besetting sins, unless we understand what happens to us and what happens to our mind, heart, and soul when we come under their power. Until then, we will fall into their trap every time. Hebrews 5.14 warns us that we need to have our senses trained through practice so that we can discern good and evil. May that be our goal. Many of the Christian Orthodox Fathers teach us that there are six distinct stages that everyone goes through. Man, woman, youth or child, when it comes to temptation and sin. These are the first three stages. One is provocation. The first step is provocation or temptation. Some call this suggestion. Provocation is that initial incitement to evil which attacks us all. Nobody escapes this. Provocation does not involve any guilt for it assails us from the outside and is independent of our free will. Adam and Eve were both provoked before the fall, and it has happened to every man and woman since then. In fact, there's nothing that you or I can do to stop it from happening. No one is free from it. Somehow this temptation enters the sphere of man's consciousness as a spontaneous impulse. Provocation is a touchstone for testing our will to see if it will be inclined towards virtue or towards vice. Two, disturbance. After provocation, something else happens. There is a momentary disturbance which is beyond the provocation. Something jars our intellect or our heart. There have been rare individuals in the history of the church who almost never entered into the second phase. They were not even disturbed by provoking sins. I don't think most of us are like that. Most of us are at least somewhat troubled when some kind of provocation hits us. To tell the truth, unless we master holiness in our hearts, we will always see this disturbance take place. The moment of disturbance is very important, for it is the portal which leads to a third phase called communion. You see, we have not entirely descended into sin when disturbance starts taking place. But when disturbance starts to shake us, it tries to move us onward into sin. Disturbance always evokes a feeling inside us. That feeling will either be one of love or hate, sympathy or abhorrence. Again, I want to emphasize, this is the most important moment because the fate of the provoking thought is decided here. Will it stay in our mind or will we force it to flee? Phase three is communion. Once he has been, a, been jarred by disturbance, a person may begin to commune with the thought, or as some say, converse with it. He starts to think about it and perhaps trying to accept it. We have all experienced this. At first, we start playing with a thought. We start turning it over in our mind. Yet still, we are hesitating because we're not sure whether or not we're going to accept to act upon it. If you watch Wild Kingdom or any of the nature shows on television, you watched scenes where a lion is going through the bush and there's a herd of little antelope out there. The lion wiggles the leaves a little bit and all of a sudden the whole herd takes off running like crazy. But there's always seems to be one animal who hesitates. You, have, you cannot help but identify with it. It's scared, but at the same time, it's curious. It wants to see a little bit more. And you look at that scene, at least I do, and you say, 
run. But because of that hesitation, sure as anything, the lion gets the antelope that hesitated. You see, at that point, we are no longer image free as when the provocation first began. This time the thought becomes, in a sense, firmly planted in the mind. And at this point, for the first time, man is morally responsible. If this thought is not immediately rejected and it lingers on, it means that somehow it has found compatible ground in the mind of the Christian. Here's where something really starts to take place. Power surges into our being. There is where passion awakes. That little tiny thought sprouts and begins to grow. At first, it could just be the thought of an ice cream cone to the person who is on a diet. Pretty soon, it becomes a 10 course dinner. The fantasy pervades the entire sphere of consciousness and it begins to rid all other thoughts from the mind. Why does this happen? Because attention to the thought lingers and because we are now beginning to delight in it. It's precisely at that moment that we need to distract our attention by the effort of our will. We're going to have to exercise some willpower because up to this point, our will has been detached in sort of a neutral way. This choice lies ahead. We can go towards the good or we can go towards the evil. At this point, we better start doing everything we know how to do, to do in order to resist. Philippians 4 says to think on good things, things of good report. We better stop thinking. We better start praying. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I'm starting to sink. Remember Peter and the waves? All he could say was, help, save me. Well, we better start doing the same thing. The Holy Writers tells us that if the sin confronting us is particularly powerful and dangerous, and if we know that it is going to capture us again, we should counterattack by calling to mind our own death. We should imagine ourselves in the coffin, see ourselves as dead already, Picture ourselves as coming before a living God, for judgment, of course. But whatever we do, we must actively and firmly resolve to rebuke the images of sin which are assailing us and not to return to them again. If we do not reject the images by an act of free will, a fourth step will begin. How to Stop Sinning, Part 2 Number four, assent. Then the will itself becomes attracted to the thought. The result is that man becomes inclined to act upon what the thought tells him, and he sets off to get satisfaction by literally partaking in this vanity. This fourth stage is called assent. At this precise moment, spiritual life is destroyed in the soul. At this point, the soul surrenders to the thought and begins to strive to realize it. It's set on experiencing an even more intense delight. It is no longer satisfied with fantasy. It now wants action. If that fantasy begins to be lust in the heart, then when a man or woman has the opportunity, he or she is like a sitting duck. Sin is going to happen in an instant. It happens with just the look of an eye. Or maybe it's not lust. It could be gluttony. It could be anger. It could be anything. You see, no longer playing with the evil suggestion, the individual now resolves to act upon it. Even if circumstances prevent it from actually happening in his life, he has already sinned in his heart. And that counts as a sin. Number five, preposition. There's a fifth process that happens in giving ourselves over to a besetting sin. It's a development of the sin as a habit over and over again. A final struggle against evil occurs, a last raging battle between doing that which is good and that which is evil. But the outcome of the struggle is based mostly on how we have acted in the past. That struggle will only be won when bad habits have not been formed within the soul. Believe me, if you already have a strong habit of this sin, you will not win the struggle. You'll just automatically do whatever it is. That is the fifth step in temptation, the development of a habit. It's called prepossession. 
It's always tragic to see people who have given themselves over to bad habits to the degree that these habits control their very lives. Maybe the habit is gossip. Maybe it is a critical spirit. Every time you talk to so-and-so, they're judging someone. Maybe the habit is depression. You don't even want to ask some people how they're doing because you know already what the answer will be. It might be right after church, right after worshiping, right after singing, but they are just some people you don't dare ask. How's it going? Because they will instantly revert to habitual depression. Others are slothful and lazy. Others are just plain greedy. Whatever you do, whenever you do anything with them, it's a one-way street. It's their way and so on. Prepossession results from repeated acts of the same sin. Soon this sin molds our very character. The principle we will we still have to face to have a free choice, but in practice, the force of the habit makes it more and more difficult to resist. At first, it was a slow process, but now it just happens we don't even have to think about it. If we do not fight at this point actively, that is, if we do not declare war on this vice that always entangles us, if we don't wage war against this prepossession, against this habit, it will form itself into our very character and become part of us. As Father Hopko stated in, uh, once in a talk to our church in Ben Le Monde, he said, quote, we are constantly being either more deified, becoming more like Christ, or we are becoming more corrupt in life is not neutral. Number six, captivity. Last of all, we enter into the sixth stage, captivity or passion. Gladly, maybe even violently, we rush to satisfy without any struggle at all the evil desires which by now are fully rooted in our heart. No longer does the will rule over simple passions. Now passions rule over the will and we are lost. In fact, even mental sickness can come in or total depression that can lead to suicide. Passion establishes the complete state of the soul. Lord, save me. So what do we do? We must, if we are sincerely striving for good, I take it, if you are reading this article, you want that which is good, for God is good, want to do and commit ourselves to do that which is good. We must use methods to form new habits of will to gain that victory in our lives. We need to understand these stages so that we can deal with our hearts and begin to make necessary changes. I don't believe that we can defeat besetting sin overnight. Oftentimes, God brings events and circumstances into our lives that will help make us aware of certain sins. But there is a difference between awareness and victory. We will have to commit ourselves to do something about our sins if there is to be a change. These are the steps to victory. So when we feel provocation assail us, what do we do? There are at least four things we can do to help. First, we must resist. We must use every effort to resist our own will, inclining to sin. That is, we must crush it by an act of our will. We must cut it off. We must not become passive. We must drive provocation away by intense effort. God has given us a will, a free will, but it's up to us to exercise that will towards righteous behavior. Secondly, I believe that we must prepare for these things ahead of time by identifying what that sin is in our lives and learning to hate that sin. That is, we must confess it and bring it into the light. We must face our greatest sin and not fool ourselves. If you are slothful, face it, say, I am. If you have a lustful heart, which goes after every other man's wife, then face it. Don't kid yourself because you need to hate it. If you are a Christian, you need to hate such impulses with your whole heart. A holy writer once said, quote, a man only truly knows he is forgiven when he hates sin with all of his heart, end quote. I like that. I really pondered on that when I first read it. We can use positional truth. We can name it and claim it and everything else. But to have real victory over besetting sin in our lives, we need to hate sin with all our heart. We need to hate it like we would hate an enemy 
who seeks to steal our possessions and destroy us. We can be angry against it, and it's all right. Isn't, it that, isn't that great? If you're a person who tends to get angry, it's really nice to be told you can be angry with something. Well, here is something with which you can get angry. Hate your sins. Thirdly, we, can, we need to appeal to our Lord Jesus Christ asking for help and for protection. We need to ask him to strengthen our damaging will, our damaged will, which was marred by the fall, the fall of Adam and Eve and all, my, all mankind. Jesus told the father of the demon-possessed boy in Matthew 17:17, 17, 17, bring him to me. Believe me, there are times when priests cannot help you. There are times when a church can't help you. There are times when you will get no other help than by first running to Christ and throwing yourself on him. The scripture says, quote, without him you can do nothing, end quote. David says, quote, call to the Lord, make haste to deliver me, O, o God, make haste to help me, O Lord, end quote. And fourthly, we need to do something opposite to the suggestion of the passionate impulse. I know a person who had plenty of money, but did not want to give a nickel to the church. He did not want to give the Lord that which belonged to him. Why? Because he was just plain greedy. He knew it, but he just could not break the habit. So he started tithing, not 10%, but 20% just to break the habit of greed. Believe me, it was worth it. You see, we have to do the opposite. Where we want to hate someone, go do an act of love towards them. Maybe a fifth defense could be listed here, watchfulness. That is, having a spiritually spiritual sobriety, an alertness, a vigilance. Just think of the captain of the oil tanker Valdez up in Alaska. Apparently, he just had a few beers. He just got a little drunk and missed his station. He wasn't watching. And look at the calamity that came upon our earth. You see, we need to watch these thoughts that come into our life. We need to watch how these fantasies grow. And we need to guard over our heart and our soul. Besetting sins, can they be beaten? Can they be eradicated once and for all from the life of the believer? They can and must if we are to live the life of purity and holiness to which God has called us. He said to us, be perfect as I am perfect. And that's what we must strive to, and he'll help us. Let us commit ourselves with heart and soul to stand firm against the devices of Satan. Let us pledge ourselves to be pure men and women whether young or old, who set out to do mortal combat against those sins which so easily overcome us. This is by Father Weldon Hardenbrook from St. Peter and Paul Orthodox Church, Ben Lamond, California, and this on Orthodox Path. I'll leave a link below for you for this.